Good morning. When uh, Max asked me to um, think of a time when uh, there was a season of overcoming and God pulled me through something, I actually had a hard time thinking of an event. And it's not so much because I knew of one and I was scared to share it, because I, I do have that too. But and I, if I sat down with my wife, she could probably sit down and tell me, you have this and this and this. And the reason I think I've had such a block in trying to think of something to share to everybody is because right now I'm going through a season of overcoming. And I want to share with you that and what God's been telling me lately, because this season, it's been one of overcoming anxiety, being burned out, and this is work-related and it's other areas of life-related, and it's also facing a lot of unknown and feeling a lack of purpose, and it gets to a point where it's hard to just have energy to do anything in a lot of days. I have plenty of energy. My heart is on fire for my wife and my daughter and our baby boy coming, and my heart is on fire and energy is there to serve and love my church. But with every other day to day, I just feel exhausted and like I'm sinking. And God has been telling me quite a few things with this in this attempt to overcome. And the first thing is, which most of the time, if we think about how we can relate to someone in the Bible, we usually are followed up with some positive vibes. But I feel like I'm relating to Peter in a not so great way. And that comes from in Matthew, it's when Jesus walks on the water. And so in chapter 14, Jesus and the disciples just fed the 5,000. They get out into a boat. They're out at sea. The disciples are without Jesus. But then all of a sudden, they're in the midst of a storm. And I'm sure they just fed 5,000 people. They're probably tired. It's the fourth watch of the night, which is like 3 to 6 in the morning. They're probably tired. And in the midst of this storm, they are probably anxious, freaking out, facing the unknown, and not knowing what to do. And Jesus comes out to them in this miraculous way, walking on the water. But they are so caught up in the storm and how it's making them feel, they don't even recognize that it's him. And they get scared, and they think it's a ghost. And Jesus says, take heart, it's me. And Peter, which this is not in the way that I think that I relate to him, but Peter says, Lord, if this is you, call me, command me to come to you. And Jesus says, come. And Peter steps out of this boat and does the miraculous, walks on the water in the midst of this exhausting, fearful storm. But this is where I feel like I'm starting to relate to Peter. He then takes his sight off of Jesus and looks at the winds and is then overcome by the severity of what his circumstances are. And he starts to sink. And then immediately he calls out to God and Jesus reaches out and he says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And that's where I'm at right now. But the great thing is, I know exactly why I'm doubting. And I think this is something that I'm hoping to encourage someone else in a season of overcoming. One thing that I do a very, very good job at, and I do this almost every day, and it causes this sinking to happen, is I fix my eyes on the storm. And I know that I can't change a lot of my circumstances right now. But every time I look at those circumstances and I just obsess over them and woe is me or I want to get out now, I do end up coming back to God and say, what do you want me to do? But it gets to a point where it just weighs more heavily. And so he's teaching me, you are paying way too much attention to this storm. And the second thing is, and this is very hard to do, but fear and faith don't really combine very well together. But when we have a Goliath in front of us, something that we need to overcome, and right now for me it's all of these things in this season, we do have to face them head on, make plans for war, seek his guidance and wisdom, and act. But when we end up, which is what I've also been doing, when we end up looking at our circumstances and then turning and looking at God and saying, God, I got this problem, I need some help, and then going back to the circumstances, and we don't take that moment to look at God and bring him in front of our circumstances and saying things like to our spirit, I know you have already gone before me. I know I'm standing on your promise. I know I'm going to get out of this. This is terrible right now and I am so exhausted, but you have already won. Now what do you want me to do next? And that is what he's teaching me now. And it's hard and I'm learning to try to do that. But one thing I think that 
the last thing I'll say is I think that we also have so many moments maybe we don't take advantage of as followers of Christ where we realize right now I'm in a season where I'm going to say, God, I'm leaning on you for this one thing, and I, can <laughs> and I cannot wait until this season of overcoming is done, and I can look back at that time where I leaned into you, whether it's one moment or daily, but leaning into you, and now I'm seeing what you have done. And one thing that I would love to share in all of this, there's a lot of fear and anxiety unknown about my wife and I trying to find a new home to live in. Our boys come in October. We got to be out of our place here in like a month, and it is honestly pretty scary. Every single place we've looked at, it's just fallen through, and we go, God, why is this so hard? We just want a home. But I know that it's easy for us. We're starting to pack things, and it's easy for us to pack things away and have fear and anxiety. Where are we going to live? Why are we doing this right now? And then sinking. But instead, I know God is calling us to walk on the waters with him and say things like, God's found a home for us. It's just a matter of time. We're going to get through this. So that when we are then in our living room unpacking our boxes, we know that God, instead of saying, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. All right, so ever since I was a little girl, I've loved looking at my life through the lens of stories, meaning I really like for there to be a clear beginning, middle, and end. And on really good days, this makes the world feel very whimsical, almost like a little romantic. But on bad days, it really reveals this idol that I've wrestled with of trying to control the narratives of my circumstances. This was really proven to be true on December 30th, 2018, when a very close family friend of mine passed away. After weeks and months of praying and fasting and repeatedly asking God to do what only he could do and heal this person, they transitioned to their eternal home in heaven. I and so many others were devastated. And what I didn't know is that I would spend the next year and a half not only walking through a deep season of grief, but also a season of wrestling and reconciling with the character of God. See, I knew that God was strong. I knew that he was a healer. I knew that he was powerful and capable of doing the miraculous. But what I really wrestled with on the other side of those beliefs was, was God kind? Was he loyal? Did he care? If you want to walk with me through a recent season of overcoming, it would be overcoming doubt. It's not that I was doubting the existence of God or the power or capabilities of God, but honestly, I was doubting the character of God. Now, I'm a church girl, so I'm going to tell you guys in the church today that I'm a little bit of a rule follower. It's also like the eldest child in me, like I'm very comfortable with rules. So if you tell me what to do and when to do it, I'm going to do my best to get it done. If you tell me where to go and who's going to be there, I'm going to try my hardest to show up. But sometimes I take this uh, twisted sense of rule following and I project it onto God. And I say, well, if I've done my part, then you need to do your part. And as you know, that is not how the Lord operates. And so God really had to grab me in this season and reveal and unveil this doubt, layers of doubt that I had fostered within my heart. And he kind of confronted me with this with a familiar story in scripture. And through this story, he showed me that there is beauty in seeing our lives as stories, but it has to be stories that God writes on his own terms and not our own. The anchor verse that God used for me in this season was John 11, verse 40, which says, Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So this verse kind of became an anchor for me in a very difficult season because if you know the context of this familiar Bible passage, we have Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Mary and Martha come to Jesus and they're like, hey, your friend is sick, please come and heal him, just like me and my community did with our friend. And instead of Jesus running to the scene and healing Lazarus as he could, he stops, he waits, he takes his time, and he allows Lazarus to die. Not only that, but then he tells the disciples he's glad Lazarus died so that a greater story of God's glory could be revealed. And as I read this story that I've read a million times since I was a little girl, I really wrestled with the tension of it all. I wrestled with a God who allows things to not go according to our plans, but to his, if I'm honest. A God who does more than what we could ask, think, or imagine in the aftermath. And so as I was reading this story, God dropped two words into my heart repeatedly. Keep reading. Keep reading. Keep reading, Natalie Brown. 
God began to show me that if I stopped reading this story when Lazarus died, I would naturally walk away disappointed. I would walk away feeling like Jesus didn't show up when we asked him to, which was the same thing I was experiencing in my life. But in order to see God's greater purpose, his greater plan, his greater vision, I had to go on the journey with Jesus to see what was the greater story that he wanted to reveal. See, in this passage, Mary and Martha knew that Jesus was a healer. That's why they came to him. But Jesus wanted to show them that he was also a resurrector. In my own life, I too knew that Jesus was a healer, which is why I came to him. But on the other side, he showed me that he is not only a healer, he is a restorer of hearts. He is a comforter to those who mourn. He is a redeemer of time. He didn't just want that to be head knowledge or scripture verses that I quoted because I'm a church girl. He wanted those to be experiential wisdom that I had because I had gone on the journey with Christ. In order to lead me on a journey of overcoming, God had to lead me out of doubt and usher me into faith. And that came with practice, step by step, day by day, reading the story that God had written. On the other side of this season, and it's a journey that I'm still walking through to this day, to be honest, God has shown me that there is great beauty in us going on the journey with Jesus because he is always writing a story that is much better than our own. Good morning, afternoon. My mind goes back to when I was in my 20s, and that was the days of the hippies. <laughs> I had started taking acid every day for two weeks, and I lost my mind. I thought the enemy was after me. I was at my, uh, my uh, cousin's house, and I, I started to try to jump out the third floor window. That's what they did in those days. And my cousin caught me by the arm. At that time, I, my sister came and told me there was a man healing on the south side. And I went there, and through prayer, I was healed within six months. That All of the acid was gone. So I kept on the journey on down the road, and guess what? I got trapped again, this time with crack, two pack of cigarettes a day, all types of alcohol and marijuana. I did this for years. And then we were in the process of changing our lives and to go into a new business, me and my wife. And uh, I said, I got to pray. I got to get this, these habits off of me. Uh, it's more of a beg than a prayer. And I called on the Lord and I prayed and I prayed. And then one day, Oh, wait a minute, let me go back. I was too fast on that. I had been in two 30-day programs, NA Anonymous, Alcoholic Anonymous. I had spent 30 days twice in those programs, and I came out, and I started right back to using drugs, smoking, drinking. And then I, I decided to pray that day. And do you know that the Lord took crack, two pack of cigarettes, all types of alcohol and marijuana away from me in that day, and I haven't wanted any sense. I haven't wanted any cravings. I don't have to go to N.A. I want to say something. I have, I'm not putting down N.A., or Alcoholic Anonymous, but when Jesus wants to heal you, you can run everywhere, all every corner, down the alley. If he wants to heal you, to, to show you that he can do anything but fail, they can't help you. They couldn't help me. They couldn't help me. But once I prayed to him in one day, and I'm talking about years, I'm not talking about a couple of weeks that I was on crack, and you know, that's it's a long story. I'm not even going to take you through it. But if you look at me, you, you don't see what I've been through. And that's all because of Jesus. He fixes us up like that. And, uh, I'm not going to go any longer. I'm going to ask you all to go to the book of Matthew, the seventh chapter, the seventh verse. And that starts out what I had to do to get Jesus to help me. Matthew 7, 7. And I want to thank you. God bless you. Fantastic. Let's give it up for all three that shared today.
I love Testimony Sunday at a lawn church. Love hearing from people in our church. And that's one thing that's on Juliet and I's heart is that it's not the two of us that are ministering and everyone else is just kind of an attender, that every single one of us is actively engaged in the ministry, right? We're being disciples, we're making disciples, and that's each and every one of us all together. And I love that um, in Junior's story, he talked about the transformation that Jesus has brought in his life. And you and I may not be addicted to acid, but the truth is that every single one of us was born with a predisposition towards rebelliousness. It's something that we inherited from all the way back in Adam and Eve. And if you need proof, hang out with kids for five minutes. You do not need to teach kids how to disobey and throw a fit, and whine, and cry, and be selfish. It comes pretty naturally for little kids. But you have to teach them how to be generous. Teach them how to, you know, follow whatever the guidance is. And and we need to, um, we're, we're born in that state where you and I are born with a predisposition for rebelliousness, and the world tries to get us to change from outside in. It's about behavior modification. So if someone, for example, is addicted to drugs, it's, well, stop doing drugs. But odds are what's happening on the outside is a manifestation of what's happening on the inside. Jesus is not about, not just about behavior modification. It is inside out soul level transformation. So when we come into a relationship with God, will that ultimately change our behavior? Yes, but it doesn't start with the behavior. It starts with addressing the need that you and I have to be in a relationship with God. Every single one of us was created to be in a relationship with God. And until you and I come into a relationship with God, there's something that's missing in our life because we were created for that, but we were born with that disconnected. And we need to make a decision in our life to say, Jesus, I give you my life. I want to make you Lord and Savior of my life. And to anybody in here who has never made that decision, I'd love to give you an opportunity to do that. Or maybe if you're in here today, maybe you you were following Jesus at one point in your life, but if you're honest, you kind of grow cold and distant in your heart you started going back and kind of veering off. The Bible talks about being a living sacrifice. And you and I can come to God and put our lives on the altar and say, God, we make you Lord. But how many of you know it's really easy for us to crawl off the altar and start walking away another direction? And so if you want to come back to Jesus today and you want to make that fresh decision, that fresh declaration of faith in him, this moment is for you as well. And if you want that same transformation, that same relationship with God that Junior and the others were talking about, then this is available to you. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, just to give people a moment of privacy, this is a private moment between you and God. If you want to know Jesus, if you want a relationship with God, maybe for the first time, or if you've wandered off, you've gotten off the altar, you've wandered away, and today you want to come back to him, and you want to make that fresh decision and declaration of faith in Jesus today, saying, Jesus, I give you my life. I want to make you Lord and Savior. This is your moment. If that's you, I'm going to count to three. And on the count of three, if that's you, you're saying, hey, I want to follow Jesus or I need to come back to him today. If you would lift your hand high enough and long enough on the count of three for me to see it, no one else is looking around. It's a private moment. This just lets me know who I'm praying for. So if that's you, you want to follow Jesus or you want to come back to him today, on the count of three, give me a wave. One, Jesus loves you. He died and rose again so you could have life. Two, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't miss this moment. Three, put your hand up. Give me a wave if that's you. Amazing. I see you in the front. See you on the side. Thank you. See you as well. Fantastic. Anybody else? You want to make a decision to follow Jesus today? Amazing. Thank you. I see you. Fantastic. Anybody else want to make a decision to follow Jesus? Amazing. Praise God. You can put your hands down and you can go ahead and look up here. The Bible says in the book of Romans that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. We will be in a relationship with God. And so for you here today, you're putting your hand up if you you did that. That's you saying, hey, I I want to believe in my heart, and now I want to help you to confess or to speak out loud with your mouth. So if you put your hand up, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Would you repeat this back after me? But we're all going to say this along with you because we're in this together. So repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I need you. I've messed up, and I need your forgiveness. And today I choose to follow you. It's by your grace that I'm saved, and by your power that I'm set free. It's a new day. In Jesus' name, 
Amen, amen, amen. Let's give a big hand for everybody who put their hand up, prayed that prayer.